Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon, everyone. First and foremost, on behalf of the Kaos Reefscape Restoration Initiative team, I would like to thank you all for coming and allocating time to attend the official Kaos Reefscape Restoration Initiative. My name is Sohat Samman. I'm the branding and communication analyst for the initiative. I'm very excited to be here today. In just a few minutes, you will discover the world's largest coral reef restoration initiative that will change how we do the coral reef restoration in the region and the world. I'm very proud to be in, I'm very proud to be I'm very proud to be part in such a unique Saudi national initiative. And we are here today to take you through our journey. If you have any question, kindly keep it during our panel discussion. We will be more than happy to address any question you may have. Let, let's get started by welcoming Dr. Ian Campbell, the Executive Director of Special Projects. Thank you, Suhad. Good afternoon, everybody, both online and in the audience. We're delighted you could join us today for the launch of this project, which really is going to show the ambition and scale of cow's activity, both within the kingdom and internationally. It's my privilege to lead an excellent team who are going to talk about our project, the plans and the delivery over the next hour or so. Uh, first of all, to get things started, I'm delighted to bring a message from our president, Professor Tony Chan. Assalamu alaikum. Good day, everyone. I am delighted to welcome you all to the launch of the Cows Reefscape Restoration Initiative at Sousa Island. Through the last decade and more, Cows has made tremendous social and economic impact in the kingdom through research, technological development, and knowledge transfer. While adhering to the core mission of Cows, we are proud to be part of Vision 2030 to respond to the national needs and also deeper partnership with governmental as well as other institutions and organizations across the kingdom. As one of the National Priorities Projects, COWS is honored to lead the Reefscape Restoration Initiative at Shusa Island in collaboration with NEOM. This project will become a demonstration of COWS developed technologies alongside other technologies that currently exist in the coral restoration field, but also contribute the bolstering the blue economy of the kingdom. This project will serve as a magnet for talent, skills, and professional development for cows and also the kingdom. As the world's largest coral restoration project, this project will support the research and development initiatives of G20 Coral Restoration and Development Accelerator Platform, also known as CORDAP. It will also augment the research by COWS faculty in the field of coral reef restoration. NEOM, our partner, is being sustainably developed from the ground up with the world's most advanced technologies to redefine how people live, work, and play. And it's a key project in Saudi Arabia's Vision 2030. NEOM brings the umbrella vision, operational infrastructure, and dedicated sites for coral propagation and in-situ planning. The combined strength of COWS and NEOM provide the research infrastructure, specialized tools, and tactical support needed to advance the project. The genesis of the project began with COWS Coral Hub, a team of faculty and researchers working to develop new approaches to coral reef restoration. That vision has now transformed into an across-COWS effort led by a dedicated team under special projects in my office, with Ian Campbell as the executive director and Tom Moore as the project director, supported by a group of internationally recognized multidisciplinary experts, from engineers who can build a critical life support system, to project managers who can operate complex facilities, 
to marine scientists with in-depth knowledge of coral restoration and the Red Sea to a workforce of divers needed to restore the reef. The project will also provide opportunities for training and development in various fields like coral aquaculture, marine operation, and restoration techniques, which will benefit cows as well as the kingdom with similar projects in the future. Cows will also have a research center at Shusa Island, which will provide a platform for our faculty and researchers to do hands-on research in the northern region of the Red Sea, which will in turn augment the ongoing research activities at KAUST. I wish the team the very best as we launch this project officially today at KAUST and looking forward to hearing the success in the coming months and years. Thank you, Dr. Chan. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. Now, I would like to welcome Dr. Maram Abadi, the Strategy and Operation Advisor at Cows Reefscape Restoration Initiative that will give an overview about the initiative. Thanks, Suhad, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, today, we're going to take you through Cows Reefscape Restoration Initiative. Uh, but let's step back for a while to remind ourselves why the coral reefs are so important. Because these animals and the entire ecosystem they build are unlike anywhere else on Earth. On Earth. They cover less than 1% of sea floor, but yet they are a multi-billion dollars in value. They sustain the livelihood of up to billions of people around the world, and they reduce the wave energy by 97% to protect the coastal line against storm, so it's protect people's life. And it's a home of mind-blowing biodiversity, a quarter of all marine life. So it's, it's the habitat, it's the underwater jungle, and if we lose the jungle, we lose all the organism in it. And by 2050, which is less than 30 years away from now, 90% uh, of world coral reefs are projected to die. So something has to change in order to have a coral reef for the future generation. And the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia positioned itself as a leader to address many uh, global challenges in environment, sustainability, and climate change. And aligning with the Saudi Vision 2030, the Kingdom recognized the responsibility to fight against climate change. So they make a huge uh, commitment to restore the uh, coral reef locally and worldwide. And because our leadership knows that we have a national treasure, which is the Red Sea, uh, the Red Sea itself is very special. It, uh, it's one of the most warmest and salty sea uh, in the world. And it's contained the most resilient and thermotolerant corals. And it's an example of a rich marine ecosystem. And a lot of scientists consider the Red Sea as a living model for ocean of the future. And since the establishment of CAOS back in 2009, the Red Sea science and technology was one of the university main focus. So uh, CAOS became a leader in the Red Sea science and technology. And CAOS attracted uh, many uh, world-class uh, uh, world researchers and scientists to, uh, to understand and study the Red Sea and to enhance the marine ecosystem in there. In Kaos, we have the Red Sea Research Center uh, that are a study the, uh, which like uh, contain uh, different research program in biology, in geoscience, in robots, AI, and uh, many more. And we have uh, the Kaos uh, Marine Science Program uh, that uh, combine different professors from different backgrounds. Some of them affiliated to the Red Sea Research Center, and some of them affiliated to physical science, computer science, and other. They develop many of a groundbreaking research. And KAUST is determined to apply all these science and research to serve the kingdom goal toward the vision, uh, Saudi Vision 2030. And the kingdom determined that Shusha Island will be an excellent spot to start deploying the cow's technique and technology. Because Shusha Island considered as untouched island, and Neom is planning to build an ecotourism resort and hotel, and they want the coral reef, the environment, the nature, to be the heart of this destination. And the, the coral reef around Shusha Island has both set a flourishing reef 
that will, that will need like a light touch of conservation and protection, and degraded reef, that will need the restoration. So in cows, we developed a program that 10 times bigger than anything done before. We are planning to restore 100 hectares of reef scape around Shusha Island, which is really a huge area. It's, a, it's about 80 combined soccer field. It's a, big, a very big area. So uh, to do that, we already start doing, we already did our baseline to understand the area in there and to plan our work. And, and soon we will have our pilot nursery. That will be a thousand square meter facility to try and test different technique and technology and to optimize our operational plan and to train our staff. So once our main facility is ready, we will be ready as well for execution. Another big part of our project is the ocean-based coral nursery. So we're gonna divide this 100 hectare into operational grid for master planning purposes. And the current condition for each grid will be mapped and detail, uh, will be mapped and evalu evalu evaluate in detail. So we will have a grid-based master plan. And then we're gonna classify and identify different zones within these 100 hectare and we'll prioritize working on them. In some location, we will have underwater coral nursery that will be capable to produce 100,000 asexual coral per year. And of course, we will have a large full marine operation that will be capable to deploy 5,000 asexual coral per day, million of sexual recruit per year, and hundreds of thousands of habitat enhancement structure over five years. And we will have a Cow Shusha Island Research Center. This facility will be in the island itself. It's gonna be a visualization center, an education center, and it's gonna engage in the visitor experience. Plus, it will be a world-class research center, to, uh, and that will host uh, permanent and visiting researcher and scientist. Another big part of this project is the land-based coral nursery, cows land-based coral nursery. So this facility will be around 55,000 square meter at Hadda Beach in Neom's land, and it will be a grand architectural design, will, and plus it will be hidden from the line, which is about six kilometers away from it. And this facility will be capable to produce 400,000 asexual coral per year, plus millions of, of sexual recruits. In this facility, we will have an advanced life support system, which is basically the coral tanks, uh, the mechanical filter, the biochemical filter, the pumps, to pump the seawater to the nursery to mimic the coral environment. And in this facility, the coral will grow in monthly rather than decay, because we're gonna use the most advanced technique and technology at the scale required to restore the reef escape at Shusha Island. Another big part of our project is the digital twin. It will be the world's largest marine digital twin, which is basically a 3D representative of the reef scape. And we are working with a different global innovator to achieve this. We are working with a company called Shelf Subsea to use a Triton, multi-beam and single beam, to navigate around Shusha Island to create a high-resolution pathometry map, which will be the pace of our digital twin. And then we're going to add different layer of data to this. And we are working with other company called CEI for data collection, basically Mosaic. And for now, they are using an underwater navigation system and uh, driver scooter, but we're gonna grow to have more autonomous data collection to increase our efficiency. And this uh, digital twin will be an amazing tool for us to monitor the coral reef and to check the health and performance of the coral. Plus, it will be an amazing platform for, for anyone from all over the globe a uh, researcher, scientist, a student, uh, and literally anyone can swim and dive virtually at Shusha Island. So our goal is to make Cows Reef Escape Restoration Initiative a showcase for the world with the most thriving reef escape with two million outplanted coral. But all this is still a traditional reef escape restoration effort. So we want to, to do the things differently, to make sure that the investment that the kingdom is making gonna last for, for generations to come. 
So we, we will do the things differently by using and utilizing the, in, the innovation and technique and technology from cows in this project. So we are funding different research uh, in cows. One of the research is with, with Professor Manuel Aranda. Uh, he's doing an assessment for five species of coral from around Shusha Island to assess their thermotolerance, to understand which genotype most likely going to uh, su survive the increased temperature and survive the coming environmental stressors. But thermotolerance is not enough. We need to make sure that those coral are healthy as they could be. So another groundbreaking research is with Professor Raquel Pixito. So Professor Raquel lies uh, understanding the microbiomes because the coral microbiome is like ours. It's important for our, our health. So the coral microbiome, it's, it's important for their health too. So Professor Raquel isolated a probiotic combination that could be injected directly to the coral in the field and in the land-based nursery as well. But even this is not enough. To do the project at scale, we need to do it smarter. So one way to do that is by using a novel substrate. So we are working with Professor uh, Charlotte uh, Hauser. She 3D printed, 3D printed the exoskeleton of the coral and then attached the coral to it by using a bioglue. And by using her uh, technique, we're going to speed up uh, the coral grow. Because the coral, like if we leave it in the nature, by, it's going to take a decade to grow. So we're going to speed up the process by using uh, Professor uh, Charlotte uh, technology. And in order like, to do the project at scale, we need to do it faster and more efficiently. One way to do that is by uh, uh, working with Professor Eric uh, Firon. Uh, he's uh, creating an autonomous vehicle that can investigate and visualize the reef escape without a uh, diver. So we're going to increase the efficiency. And he can provide all these data to feed the, our digital twin. Another groundbreaking research is with, with Professor Carlos Duarte. Uh, he's taking much more holistic approach to understand the reef escape. So he's looking to the soundscape because healthy reef escape make a different sound than unhealthy reef escape. Combining that with environmental DNA as a tool to deeper understand of the reef escape around Shusha Island. Usually in the conventional uh, uh, monitoring method, we're using an individual sensor and deploying in a different places to look at uh, temperature, uh, pH, turbidity, salinity, but, we are, but in this project, we are working with Professor uh, Maggie Johnson uh, to create an integrated uh, network of uh, sensor that will provide a real-time data, and that will help our decision maker to be a proactive for the coming uh, challenging future. And COWS assembled a team of internal experts and experts from all over the globe to take this vision in behalf of the kingdom. And we are partnering with NEOM, and we have different collaborators and uh, consultants. And we want the king, like moving forward, we want the kingdom to be the global hub of the coral reef restoration. And in order to do that, we are developing a Saudi talent program. So we're going to train and educate the young Saudi to become an expert uh, in the field of coral reef restoration. So basically, we are building our local uh, manpower to do this project because we are thinking like we want this project to be a sustainable project. So no, pro no project ever has put all these pieces together. No project ever has taken a decade of knowledge in, in the region, uh, combining with research, combining with monitoring, combining with building a modern uh, land-based coral nursery anywhere in the world. So Cow's Reef Escape Restoration Initiative will be the model, and it will change the future of the reef escape restoration. And this initiative is driven by Saudi Arabia to the world. No country is impervious to the ripples of global change. We must have a roadmap forward. Work is already being done to invest in our people, culture, economy, and environment. A foundation of this vision, NEOM, seeks to reimagine how we build for modern lives. To support these efforts, KAUST is taking the lead in supporting one of our most vital and vulnerable ecosystems. 
we are creating an integrated reef restoration model with the world's largest and most advanced coral nursery and a marine operation to protect and restore a 100 hectare reef adorning Shusha Island in the Northern Red Sea before beginning to support restoration across the region. So we invite you to follow our efforts to explore our reefscape through immersive virtual innovation as we embark on this first chapter in an unfolding legacy to celebrate the natural wonders of every corner of our shared world. So, thank you. Uh, if you are interested to know more about our initiative, please scan the QR code and please step by our uh, booth in the library this week. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maram. Now we will have our panel discussion. Our panel discussion will be moderated by uh, Jerry Thomas, the head of strategy and planning at Cows Reefscape Restoration Initiative. Thank you, Suhad. Good afternoon, everyone. Almost a decade and a half back, history started getting created with, with a vision to build the world's, one of the world's leading universities in the world. And I was privileged to be part of this from the very beginning, and 15 years later, we are creating another history or creating a chapter of that history by cows taking the lead to lead the world's largest coral restoration project in the world. And this is not done by one individual, one team, or even a group of teams in this cows project. And we all should, should take pride in the fact that we are all part of this journey. Before I get into the role of moderator, I just wanted to say a few thank yous, especially to the internal stakeholders that we have here, uh, HR, finance, procurement, facilities management, legal, academic community here on the, on the campus, and many other stakeholders who work very closely on a day-to-day -day basis. Without their support, we wouldn't be making such progress so far. With that, I would like to get into my role of the moderator for today's panel discussion. First of all, I would like to welcome Dr. Ian Campbell, Executive Director of Special Projects, to the stage, please. Tom Moore, Project Director. Amaratheya, Chief Proponent and Director of Central Services. Dr. Lix Gorgon, Head of Monitoring, Visualization, and Data Management. Dr. Zach Forsman, Head of Reefscape Planning. <laughs> Last but not certainly not the least, Professor Aquel Picciotto, Associate Professor of Marine Science. Thank you all for joining the panel discussion today. And this is a live uh, panel discussion, so you all have the opportunity to ask questions. As you can see, you have two mics on the, on the sides. If you have any questions any time during the discussion, please get up and come closer to the mic, and uh, we, will, we will call you to ask your question. And those who are online, please make sure that you type in your questions online, and we will take that question as type permits. So without further ado, let me ask Dr. Ian Campbell, um, just to elaborate further from where Tony sort of stopped um, in his speech how do you see this cow strategic project, one of this cow strategic project, benefiting the kingdom and cows in the long term uh, future? So I think, first of all, I'll say the aspiration for the project is not to outplant two million corals. The purpose of the project is to create a thriving reescape by 2040. And between now and then, cows is going to create the largest test bed for coral restoration, but also for scientific research. That's why the research center is going to play such a vital role. But we're actually creating new infrastructure to determine how can we farm coral at scale, how can we put that down, what conditions do corals thrive in, and how can we adapt the environment for them. Thirdly, I think our scientists will be attracted to try and try new techniques as we go from what is today very much a manual process into hopefully a semi-automated, then an automated platform, and really try and take that technology and then diffuse it, not just within the Red Sea, but enable others to learn from our mistakes, which we are going to make as we do this project, because nobody's tried this before at scale. 
but also to make sure that ongoing, if we look at what Maram said, we've got an environmental crisis by 2050, as if we leave things today, we're gonna to be in trouble. So we need to try and have these new techniques to try and enhance coral, not just restoration, but to enable corals to thrive more generally. Thank you, Ian. And just taking on from there, Tom, you've been involved in multiple projects around the world. You've been in this field for some time. How do you see this, dif this project different from some of the other projects you've been involved in or you know, all, all the other projects that are going on around the world? Yeah, thanks, Jerry. Coral restoration is still a very young field in the big scheme of things. I, I like to joke with the team at times that you know, we've been building buildings since the pyramids, but we've really only been restoring coral reefs for the last 12 years or so at, 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 any, at any bit and really never truly yet at scale. And so this project is unique in a lot of ways. Not only does it integrate uh, so many different elements together into one project where so many projects really tend to focus on one or two individual pieces. We've taken with this project and combined all of the possible uh, elements of a project into one. It takes it to scale in an unprecedented way. And that's not only just important for this work at Susha Island, but it's really important for the kingdom's vision as a whole in terms of utilizing the Red Sea as that center of excellence. Um, as a destination, as a tool to teach the next generation, and then to have the Red Sea and the Kingdom's work really expand and go around the world in terms of being the, the integrated place uh, where reef restoration can really see its, uh, its seeds grow from a relatively nascent field um, to really one that is uh, globally expansive and globally needed. Thank you, Tom. And just to remind the audience again, if you have any questions, please, anytime you can stand up, come close to the, st uh, to the mic, and we'll be happy to take the questions. Coming to Amar, um, Amar, you're, I'm, I'm sure you're excited about taking the lead on designing this amazing facility that we are looking at. Um, how do you see this um, as a challenge, and also what are the sort of design principles that we are following while we are designing this building? Uh, thank you, Jerry. First of all, it's a pleasure to be part of this amazing project for KAUST. As you've mentioned, it's challenging uh, being working for the largest coral restoration, and it's also the largest coral nursery worldwide that we'll be building um, over there at NEOM. So uh, being over there at NEOM and being the largest coral nursery in the world, uh, it's a challenge and an exciting project to be in. Um, one of the major design principles that we're applying is having a signature architectural theme over there that blends well with the surrounding projects. We are six kilometers away uh, south of the, uh, of the line, the famous Neom project. We're about 16 kilometers away from the famous now Shusha Island that will be built, which is magnificent. So uh, blending well with the surroundings over there, having a signature architectural design is one of the main design principles. Um, being also having a f building a factory over there for the uh, to grow the nursery to, to grow the corals over there is one of the major design principles that we're applying. Mass production over there uh, it's going to be a major thing that we'll be focusing on. Yet flexibility and adaptability that will help us in the future to apply new technologies as we grow more into learning new technologies to grow corals faster. Um, also, um, applying the latest technologies, probably you've seen in uh, the presentation by Dr. Maram, will be applying some robotic arms over there to speed up and, uh, the growth and also be more efficient. Lastly, uh, this nursery also will be the uh, focal hub of marine operations over there for uh, the coral growth. So maybe just to take it from there a bit more, Amr, um, just to elaborate a bit more on the functional uh, uh, functionalities of this building, you know, non-technical, technical functionalities of this facility in general, if you can just elaborate a bit there. So in terms of functionalities, uh, so uh, we're applying the village concept. So we'll be having distributed buildings over there in the coral nursery. Uh, the major building is gonna be the nursery itself, the coral farm. This is where we'll be having the um, the tank farms, the life support system, which is a very crucial system for the growth of the corals, uh, in addition to all of the offices and the amenities. Other building will be the marine operation building. This is where we'll be having the dive operation, the uh, boat operation and maintenance. Uh, another buildings will be all of the supporting uh, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. All of those uh, village components uh, will be shaded 
to help in uh, having it blending well with the surroundings. Uh, and also we'll be having a GT support facility to make sure that uh, all of the GT operations are well managed. Thank you, Omar. Maybe jumping the queue a bit and coming to Raqqa a little bit. Um, you are um, doing a project as part of this initiative. Maybe just give a, a brief about what is sort of the objectives of that project and how that project is going to help this initiative and, and maybe other projects also. Yeah, yeah so uh, what we are doing specifically for the Shusha project is that we are customizing uh, probiotics, that is medicine, nat nature-based medicine that can help these corals, that can make them grow faster and maybe make them more resilient at the same time. So with that, we want to save time so that if, it, if we can make the corals in the nursery grow faster, we'll be saving uh, time and, 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 and resources and bring them to the field faster. And we, what we also hope is that these corals, because they will be healthier with the use of these probiotics, this is what we expect to see, uh, they will be more resilient, so they are more prone to resist the current scenario and future, uh, future uh, bleaching events. Uh, so it's a, more, it's a very holistic uh, way to use medicine. It's based on that specific organism. So basically what we do is that we try to retain the good bacteria, the good microorganisms living within corals. All corals and all organisms rely on this microbiome, but the problem is that when these corals and then the reefs are exposed to stress, these good microbes are replaced by pathogens, and this is what's happening. And so we are trying to incorporate this sustainable way uh, that is also being incorporated for humans, for corals, and even take advantage and use something that can make them grow faster on top of making them healthier. So maybe just staying on science, I just recently read a paper titled Appraisal of Coral Bleaching Thresholds and Thermal Projections for the Northern Red Sea Refugia by some of our researchers. And it sort of states that corals in the Northern Red Sea exhibit high thermal tolerance despite the increasing heat stress. So with that, do you think that the site sort of that we have selected as for this project, is it a good choice and, and you know how, are the corals going to survive longer there uh, with, with this paper coming out and what is, science is saying it's a very good question it's a very interesting question especially because that this paper came from a postdoc in my group dr aslan osman and um uh, based on their findings yes this is probably the best place in the world uh, to run this experiment because based on their findings, these corals are more resilient. And so they are gonna be, they're likely going to be the last one standing. So if we can um, restore these corals, we can learn from the process of restoring and building a reef from scratch and restoring reefs. We can then apply this knowledge to other places uh, around the globe. And from my perspective, it's also very good to be working in a, in a place like the Red Sea and with these corals because it's likely that their probiotics are also the most powerful yeah. one in the world, yeah. just like the corals. Thank you, Raquel. Let's, so we heard it again in the presentation that we are going to have a digital twin as part of this project. Again, I've heard you saying that digital twins are not new in the world. We have done digital twins for many other projects on land probably mainly. Um, so how do you see this being different from other digital twins that are being developed and implemented around the world? And, what are sort of the challenges that you're seeing and when can we see the first phase of this digital twin? Sure, so uh, we're going to build on what's already known. Digital twins are not known, or not new, I should say. So we'd be building on the knowledge base that's already there, that digital twins are used for city planning um, and, and across the globe, they're used as a resource. And the challenges that we run into are working underwater. As many of you in the room know, um, who work underwater, it's, it's a challenging environment. And with that comes um, image collection. To create a digital twin underwater, you need a tremendous amount of imagery. Um, right now we're doing that all diver-based. And that's calculated to take us approximately one year to cover this as a diver-based operation. So therefore we need to look into autonomous vehicles and other, other technologies to increase our efficiency in collecting those data. Um, in addition to that, working underwater, you have a different day different water quality every day, the conditions and environment can influence the product that you're getting. So we also need to develop processes that can um, eliminate those um, or, or enhance those 
conditions so that we have a very high quality product. We're shooting at sub centimeter, sub millimeter level in some areas so that we can look at in detail what's happening on the reef scape. And so these all, all of these also require a lot of computing capacity and storage capacity, so we need to be developing um, or bringing in the, the, the experts in the field so that we can create a product and deliver it to, to the world. Um, we don't want this product to sit on the shelf. We see it as a, as a usable resource for everyone from grade school children up to senior researchers um, and to, to really establish something that's um, a really well-used product for teaching and learning about coral reefs and coral reef restoration. Thank you, Liz. And Zach, 100 hectares of reefscape, almost equivalent to 180 football fields, as I heard, is a huge area to restore. I'm sure you're doing sort of a high-level master planning for this area. What, what, what is the planning process that you're undertaking as part of this project? Well, as you can imagine, it's, it's a challenge. Um, I've been involved in uh, building three coral nurseries, two in Hawaii and one in the Red Sea. Um, and they're fairly large-scale nurseries, but uh, the scale of this project is just absolutely phenomenal. It's very exciting to be a part of. I'm learning uh, all these things about uh, you know, development and building buildings and all kinds of things. We, re we really have to approach this differently. It's not, uh, the scale of this is going to require more of an engineering approach or almost like a, a, a real estate developer type of approach, thinking about um, planning underwater the entire reefscape. So it's starting from this amazing digital twin and all the monitoring data that Liz was speaking about and that Dr. Moram was showing on the, on the screen earlier. That's the base layer for understanding where, what areas do we prioritize for conservation, what areas do we protect and leave alone, what areas are control sites so that we can understand the difference between the manipulations that we do uh, versus natural fluctuations. And then we also need to have sites where we can do direct um, planting. We have sites that are specified for uh, showcasing uh, KAUST research and development zones for really uh, looking at the cutting edge technologies and efforts and research and development that KAUST is, uh, and the Coral Hub is, is implemented um, and kind of showcasing that to the world. We also have areas that are dedicated to a visitor uh, experience that we'll be collaborating with our partners in, in Neom to develop moving forward. Um, Good. And, and <laughs> just to maybe take it from there, I'm, uh, I understand that we have in situ as well as ex situ nursery, which Amar is sort of leading with the design for the ex situ nursery. But we have also in situ nurseries, and, and we are sort of expecting that we're going to have 100,000 corals produced from that in situ nursery at peak. Uh, so, what is sort of the difference between in situ and ex situ for the, for the benefit of the audience? And why is it important that we need to have an in situ nursery or in situ nurseries as part of this project? Yeah, so the project is going to uh, need both types of nurseries. So in situ nurseries are in the water. Um, they tend to focus on fast growing branching corals. It's a common technique that's used throughout the world. Um, but the disadvantage is that you don't have a lot of control. Um, the advantage is that you don't have to have a lot of expense in terms of pumps and filters and lighting and so on and so forth which is what the ex situ nursery provides. So ex situ is on land, and this is the, the large building that Amara was talking about and was featured in the, in the film. Um, and this is really where you can have fine-tuned control, and this is a good opportunity to uh, grow corals when they're really small and they're very vulnerable. Like So from the larval stage or from microfragmentation, which is a propagation method that really speeds up coral growth by, uh, by many orders of magnitude. Thank you. And Tom, coming back to you um, on the operation, the scale of the operations that we're looking at for uh, executing, you know, implementing this scale of a project from manpower requirements to aquaculture, FM. So if you can just give an idea about the sort of scale of operations that we're looking at as part of this project. Yeah, we've heard a lot of people talk about scale so far and big and things like that. And, and uh, I'll break it down a little bit more in, into some finer details, right? So we say 100 hectares. Um, all of these mini football fields in size. But w when it comes down to that, to, to execute that, we've looked at it and we've said, all right, this needs probably, you know, about two million corals added to it. It needs hundreds of thousands of structures. And you start to break that down over a couple year period of time, uh, really four to five years at the most, where we're going to be truly trying to rebuild this site. 
And that means you can't work on the water every single day. Some days it's really windy, right? And then, so that means to, to achieve that scale, we need to plant on the order of 5,000 corals per day. Um, and if you start to think about actually doing that, and any of you that are divers that have worked underwater, recognize that you can only be underwater for a few hours every single day. And you think about taking something that's the size of that water bottle and planting 5,000 of them across the reef. That requires a massive amount of manpower. We're anticipating in excess of 60 divers potentially working underwater at any given time at this site. And those 60 divers then need to be supported by the boat crew that works on the boats, 10 to 12 individual boats working there at any given point in time. The scientists that are then working to understand that is a whole nother team of people that then move back to this coral nursery that Amr talked about that really has a marine operation that's capable of supporting all of these resources, just like we have here at KAUST that is uh, dozens of individuals as well. And then we look at that coral nursery with goals of producing 400,000 corals per year over nearly 500 individual tanks within that. That requires people to clean it. In excess of, there's people, 30 people alone to potentially clean tanks, um, another 25 to 30 to just take care of those corals. And you start to look at those numbers over the course of this project, and the next thing you know, we have hundreds of individuals engaged in doing this, which is a massive opportunity um, to create a diverse talent pool that's coming out of the kingdom that can ultimately work on other projects in the kingdom here as well. But it's also a massive opportunity for us to engage technology to create, to be more efficient, not so we can eliminate jobs, but so we can work even faster within this process, so we can deliver not this project, but whatever the next project is in the Reefscape Restoration Initiative. And so we're gonna be investing in technology along the way, so those hundreds of people as they work on this project can be even more efficient, do even more work uh, than we've already asked them to do. And I'm sure much of the team are saying, geez, no more work, but, um, <laughs> It's a, it's a huge project with a lot of resources to take to pull it off, um, and we're really excited, and we are, have built an amazing team, many of which are in the audience here today, that are really the founders of, of this project and getting started, and over time, we'll have many more joining us. Yeah, thank you. I'm just, I'll take a pause here for the audience. If you have any questions, if you can just raise your hands or come closer to the mic if you have any questions. We have two mics on the on, on the sides. If not, I'll come back to Ian and just quick question on the research center that we heard being built and being built on, on the island on the Shusha Island. How do you see that sort of helping the cows mission or furthering the cows research in general? Well, I, th I think we already acknowledged that the, during Dr. Maram's uh, presentation earlier that we already had excellent facilities here at KAUS with Seymour, the Red Sea Centre, the initiatives with all the uh, professors and faculty. But we don't have anything proximal to a reef at scale. And so the idea is that that centre would attract not just cow scientists or neom scientists, but international scientists trying to understand the biology in the Red Sea. And at the same time, we can use that to prepare samples and take them back to cows for more thorough analysis because effectively it's a, it's a basic field station, but it has the opportunity for sample collection. The other attribute that the research center is going to have is we are going to do all of the digital monitoring of the Reescape for the next 20 years from that site. As I said, when we plant the last coral after 60 months of operation in the nursery, that's when the biology really begins because we see the impact. We measure the ecosystem, we use the sensors, and we actually monitor the wildlife and how, what other species are we attracting as a result of the endeavors we're undertaking. So it's going to play a critical role both in helping to recruit and retain scientists, to allow us to collaborate internationally, and also to bring samples back to cows for further analysis with the great facilities we have here at Core Labs and other sites. Thank you, Ian. And I have a question online that is for Raquel. What is Coral Probiotics Village? Okay. Uh, so the Coral Village is an underwater laboratory. It's the first of its kind. It's really a city. We have gates, we have streets, and we have uh, tagged colonies. And, and the reason why we have this um, distributed like this is because we are running uh, research mm -hmm. using these colonies and these things that we are tagging. And eventually these, uh, these experiments that we run, they are very complex, and we need to find ourselves on the 
the water, and then you have to find the colonies, and this is why we started uh, mapping them and, and tagging them as streets. So we know where we are, we have Nemo Street, so we know we are close to the anemones and the clownfish, so we know where we are. But the goal of having these villages is that we have a permanent laboratory that is being closely monitored over time for almost two years now. So we have environmental and biological data from this place. We have different PIs working together and then we can correlate our data and we are testing cutting edge uh, tools to increase coral resilience. So it's really focused on restoration and rehabilitation and the notion that we need corals that will actually survive the current um, scenario that we have and the future scenario that we will have in the face of global change. So the idea is to develop probiotics, uh, um, other, many other tools, and even uh, we are using now also artificial intelligence to help us. So on top of having an underwater city, which is new, we have an underwater city that has an irrigation system deployed and this irrigation system, uh, uh, we can regulate from our app, from, from a phone, from a mobile phone, and we can uh, deliver probiotics, and in the future we can do it for vitamins or anything we want to deploy in real time in the reef without having to go there. So this is the type of research that we are developing here 20 minutes from our labs in, in Taust. Thank you, Raquel. David. Thank you. Uh, David Keyes, Extreme Computing Research Center. Uh, inspiring presentation and discussion. I'm delighted to see Dr. Gorgon up there representing the integration of digital twin with all the other technology and uh, to hear about AI assisting Raquel. And uh, I would like to, uh, you know, sort of raise the question uh, at its minimum, a digital twin is a repository for observational data, the, the massive gathering you've described, and an ability for both the local researchers and perhaps other scientists around the world to interrogate that data. But I'm wondering if you're also planning to have modeling built into the digital twin of, for instance, physical oceanography, biological oceanography that can be assimilated, it can assimilate the data and actually produce predictive uh, views of the, the reefscape, not simply track what is being brought into it by observation, but a, a dual modeling and observational uh, capability. Yes. <laughs> um, I think we really plan to integrate as much as we can in all types of data really to inform the restoration community. So things that are important, we will hope to, to really integrate modeling data, predictive um, data as well, so that we can utilize all aspects of a digital twin and the data that it can um, integrate into it and output from it. So. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that and say that, so our vision there, as Dr. Maram talked a little bit about in the talk, is to, you know, this digital twin where you'll be able to see things, but you'll also be able to go to an individual spot at that site and click on, uh, a, you know, a, a data point and be able to get real-time data from that. So what's the temperature at any given point in the water? What's the current that's moving over an individual place at an individual point in time? And we have aspirations, though we're still figuring out exactly how we're going to get there, of ultimately being able to click on an individual coral within that site and maybe find out about the history of that coral. Where was it grown at? Where did it come from? Maybe what do we expect the traits of that coral to be long term? So that's kind of what we're, we're doing, but this is a new thing and we're going to be figuring out as we go and then sharing these techniques that we develop here with lots of other projects other places. And so the digital twin we develop will probably serve as a foundation of a digital twin here off of Kaust and a digital twin elsewhere in the Red Sea and eventually elsewhere in the world. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Liz. Please. Hello. Uh, my question has to do with what is actually there at this time. Is there significant structure? Is there a lot of coral currently there in the restoration process? And then the second question is, how many species of coral do you, are you looking for, looking to um, plant, and how much is needed for a healthy environment? Thank you, and your name? My name is Safa Saber. Okay, and Tom, do you want to take the first part of that? Yeah, I'll take the first part, or maybe Zach, do you want to yeah. take the second part? So, Sushi is a really interesting place. Um, it has some of the kingdom's most amazing coral reefs, true national treasure of the kingdom in certain places of the reef uh, and the site. And then there's other sections of the site that are very heavily degraded. Um, and they definitely represent different habitats, 
um, over different depth regimes at the site, and that's something we're still trying to best understand. And so it's gonna be a mix of things that are necessary at that site in terms of approaches um, and in terms of techniques that we, we use there. But it really is an interesting place, and we anticipate in some places at that site where it's heavily degraded or there's no structures that we're gonna need to actually build up some of that habitat complexity back. In some cases, that may be low relief, but in many cases, it may be very high relief uh, habitat complexity because what we've seen at the site already is the areas that are the best are the areas that have the most habitat complexity, the most rugosity associated with them, um, and the areas that are the most degraded, though we're clearly reef at one point, are the areas that tend to be pretty lower relief in slightly deeper water. Maybe I'll pass to Zach for the second part. Yeah, so the second part of the question was about uh, species diversity and kind of how many species there are uh, at, at Shusha. So it's estimated around 150 species, possibly uh, 350 species of coral in the Red Sea total. But um, coral species are really, really difficult to uh, tell apart. And uh, one of the leading experts in the world is based right here at, at Kaus, Professor Francesca Benzoni. She's been really kind of uh, rediscovering and rewriting the, the, the rules for understanding what, uh, what species are, are what. And there's a lot of ongoing genetic work that's showing that um, a lot of in corals in the Red Sea are endemic, that they don't occur anywhere else, even though they look similar to other places in the world, they're unique. And it turns out that Shusha is actually a real hot spot for endemicity, so there's a lot of corals that uh, don't occur anywhere else. So we need to be very cognizant of trying to uh, maintain genetic diversity while we're doing restoration to maintain a healthy ecosystem. We don't want to uh, do something that would overwhelm any of the endemics. So we're gonna have to be working uh, with some of the more abundant species and some of the more familiar species, but also uh, beginning to work, especially with KAUST researchers, to understand a little bit more what's endemic, what's rare, and how do we give them a boost as well. Thank you, Zach. We have time for two questions. Bill? Yep, thank you. Uh, Bill Roberts. When I see pictures of the reef, I always see fish. So uh, do you have to worry about the fish population? Is that going to, you build it and they come? Uh, are they symbiotic relations? Do you, is there, something like that. Thank you, Bill. Let's so uh, in, in restoration or coral reefs in general, usually complexity, you see a lot more fish. Um, it's not always they build it, they will come. Um, and so those are some things that we will be integrating into our restoration design and monitoring is, can we design reefs to attract certain fishes? Um, can we design things to enhance um, recruitment of fishes as well? There is a pretty diverse fish community already there, and we will be uh, monitoring that closely, not only just at the reefscape where we're re restoring, but <clears throat> as fishes move, so surrounding the island as well too to see what we are changing through, through restoration. But that's a, a question that we always want to answer with restoration is how is restoration impacting the greater ecosystem? And those are questions that we, we hope to be answering through our extensive monitoring program. Thank you, Let's, we have somebody there. Yeah, uh, yeah hello, uh, Ali Mhanna. Uh, my question is about the economics of the project. So um, I realize the project may be more uh, focused with the mission on uh, restoration and preservation of the environment, but um, like, is there any, any way to expand on the economics of the project if there is a way to get like break even or get some returns on the investment? Thank you, Ali. Yes, yeah. yeah, so, so the, the blue economy is in its infancy. Uh, what we hope to achieve in the, the first five years is to understand actually what is our operational cost base because we're trying to do this at scale for the first time, so we need to understand what are the economics that we're putting in. And then the aim is post year five, we then start to view how does that coral become self-sustaining for the longer term. The aspiration is that the, the, the nursery will be active for at least 25 years post the project. So what we're trying to do is then look at how do we collaborate with others, how do we get industry involved, and how do we create a sustainable financial model at the same time as enhancing coral reefs up and down the Red Sea. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Ali. Maybe a last question to Tom or Ian. Um, what does success look like for you in this project? Yeah, success uh, on this project really is, is more than Susha Island, right? So Susha Island is an amazing place for this to start, 
right? But as we really expand, what success looks like for us is the techniques that we develop, the mistakes that we make, the talent that we, we grow begins to work throughout the Neom region, throughout the Red Sea, and eventually around the world. And the problems we have with, with coral reefs are immense. Right? And the opportunities we have with this project is the opportunity to start to get ahead of that problem. And so success for me on this project is not just about this place. It's really about how we take the investment that we're making and make a difference more broadly around the world. Thank you, Tom. And thank you to all the panelists, if I can call Ian to the stage and just for the last closing remarks. So firstly, a few thank yous. Uh, I want to thank the team, uh, Maram and Suhad in particular, for working on the presentation for several weeks. We really want to encourage you to go and see the booth, interact with the team, learn more. We always like questions. Uh, I'm particularly proud of leading this team and this project. This is a one of a kind in the world. The ambition that we're showing here with KAUST, with NEOM, to collectively try and make a difference to a planet is an enormous challenge for us. It's one we face head on. We are grateful for all the support from all the stakeholders throughout KAUST and beyond. I really want to thank each and every one of you for your attention and wish you a very good day. Thank you very much. Thank you.